Chapter 1 Giants in the Bible Old Testament Giants According to the Bible, giants have existed since the beginning of man. There are many written records of individuals in excess of eight feet tall. They existed before the flood in Noah's day, and we read about them even after the flood. This section will focus on the Nephilim, those giants that existed before the flood and are first mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. The Hebrew word Nephilim in Genesis 6-4 means the fallen ones, or causing to fall. These giants will be our topic throughout this book. The Bible reveals that some giants were human, and some were angelic beings, while others seem to be a biogenic hybrid. The word for giant is translated from the Hebrew and appears in the King James Version in a number of forms. They are Nephilim, Rephaim, Repha, singular of Rephaim, found in 1 Chronicles 20, 4, 6, and 8, or Repha, singular with slightly different spelling, found in 2 Samuel 21, 16, 18, and 22. Giants after the Flood What is fascinating is that giants also appear after the flood, and Scripture reveals they become the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis some 850 years after the flood, reveals that these giants had been around for a long time. Giants are embodied in every culture around the world. They are in legends of old. However, today we are led to believe that these legends and traditions are considered only to be mythological creatures that never really ever existed except in the imaginations of ancients. We will consider their existence later on in chapter 6. Let us first acquaint ourselves with the giants after the flood and through the period of the kings of Israel according to biblical text. Rephaim Giants In Genesis 14.5, we read about a race of giants called the Rephaim, the word Rephaim is used some 25 times in the Old Testament, and in each place where it is used, it refers to giants. These giants lived at the time of Abraham and Lot. They were a race of giants, Deuteronomy 3.11, who lived to the east of the Jordan River. They were apparently the original inhabitants of the land before the immigration of the Canaanites and were conquered by King Chedorlaomer, Genesis 14, 5. Their territories were promised to Abraham as a possession, Genesis 15, 20. We read, quote, In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and subdued the Rephaim, in Eshtaroth Karnaim, with Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shabe Kiriathim, Genesis 14, 5. End quote. They are mentioned in other passages, including Joshua 15, 8, 18, 16, 2 Samuel 5, 18, 23, 13, 1 Chronicles 11, 15, 14, 9, and Isaiah 17.5. The Emim Giants The Emim were another warrior tribe of giants who were also defeated by Chedorlaomer and his allies. This also occurred around the time of Abraham, who lived shortly after 2000 BC and about 400 years after the flood. The Emim Giants also lived east of the Jordan. Quote, the Emim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants. 
Rephaim, like Anakim, but the Moabites call them Emim. Deuteronomy 2, verses 10 and 11. End quote. After warring against the cities of Plain, King Chedorlaomer went on to plunder the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. At Sodom, among the spoils of war, he took Lot and his entire household captive. When Lot's uncle Abram received news of what happened, he assembled a battle unit of 300-plus men who pursued the Elamite forces north of Damascus. Abram and his forces defeated King Chedorlaomer and took back all that had been taken. Genesis 14, 8 through 16. Zuzim, or Zamzumim, plural, giants. Likewise, the Zuzim were a tribe of giants that Lot's descendants destroyed near Ammon, east of the Jordan River. The land allotted to Lot, Abraham's nephew, was also regarded as a land of giants, Rephaim. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Anakim Giants In the book of Numbers, we read about yet another group of giants when the spies encountered the seven sons of Anak as they entered Canaan. The name Anak was given to a Canaanite tribe who were the descendants of the sons of Anak. The Anakim were sons of Anak who was the son of Arba, who apparently was a distant son of Amoraeus who was the son of Canaan, who was the son of Ham, the son of Noah. The Anakim, Zamzumim, and Emim were of the family tree of Nephilim. The Im in these words signifies plurality, as does S in English. We read, There also we saw Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Numbers 13.33 When Israel entered the Promised Land, God told Joshua to wipe out everyone from four tribes. One of the tribes was Anakim, who lived south of Israel near Hebron. They were defeated by the Israelites under Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them over to Israel, slain. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed. And Joshua came at that time and wiped out the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anub, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. Joshua eleven twenty one, God and genocide. Is God prejudice? Does God get angry and commit random acts of genocide as we read in Deuteronomy 3, 5 through 7, and in 7, 1 through 3? Many people, even Christians, are shocked by this command. Why would God give such an evil directive to kill all the women and children? Certainly part of the reason is that both before and after the flood, God was directly involved in the destruction of the giants. God was on an empire-breaking campaign. Much like when he destroyed the Egyptians at the time of the Exodus, the reason for their destruction is not stated directly. But like Goliath, these men always seem to be in opposition to God and to his people Israel. However, as we shall see, God's primary purpose was to preserve the posterity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
who, through King David of the tribe of Judah, was promised that his seed would bring forth the Messiah, Christ. Second, Israel was on a clean-up assignment. The inhabitants of the land were involved in satanic rituals, including sacrificing and burning their babies in worship to their pagan gods. Preserving the family line, or the seed of King David and his descendants, will be covered in section 2. From the beginning of time, Satan has been seeking to destroy the seed which would bring the promised one into the world, who will one day crush Satan's power. Genesis chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 20. Satan has not given up. He is still seeking to destroy the seed, offspring, of those God has a covenant with, all the followers of the Messiah, Christ. Abraham and Moses acknowledge God's integrity. In Genesis chapter 18, we find God's response to Abraham's inquiry regarding God's integrity. Apparently, the purpose of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was that they were totally polluted and contaminated. As a result, judgment must come. However, because of one man's intercession for his family, we discover in chapter 19 that God makes a way of escape. Yet, even then, not all accept the way of escape. Verses 14 and 29. A couple of chapters later, in Genesis chapter 20, we read the story of King Abimelech and Abram's wife Sarai, where God was about to destroy the king and his kingdom for violating marital laws of sexual behavior in taking another man's wife. But God was just in sparing the king from judgment when the king reminded God of his innocence. The bottom line... God is a just God, whether we understand the situation or not. Later we read, quote, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. End quote. Numbers, chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. King Og. As we continue our study of the giant genealogy in Scripture, we read about a giant whose bed was between 13 and 14 feet long. Quote, King Og of Bashan was the last survivor of the giant Rephaim. His bed was made of iron and was more than 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. It can still be seen in the Ammonite city of Rabbah, Deuteronomy 3, 11, and Joshua 12, verse 4. Again, giants appear in the scene, when Canaanite king Chedorlaomer fought with a number of local kings, included with the Zuzim, Zamzumim, in the town of Ham in the Dead Sea area. Those giants, who apparently descended from Canaan, the descendants of Noah's son Ham, through a man named Anak, eventually became extinct. King Og of Bashan was the last of them to inhabit Palestine, east of the Jordan River. Deuteronomy 3, verse 11. We all know the story of the twelve spies that Moses sent into Canaan to search out the land and prepare the entry of the twelve tribes of Israel into their promised land. But it was the sight of huge giants that caused ten of the spies to rebel against crossing into their land. Quote, And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it 
are men of great stature. There we saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak who came from the Nephilim, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Numbers 13, 32, and 33. End quote. There were four primary tribes with the descendants of the Nephilim in the Promised Land, and Joshua was instructed to wipe them out. However, it took time before most but not all of the giant tribes were removed from the land. Later, Joshua was able to record that the greatest giant of the Anakim tribe, a man named Arba, was defeated and the land had rest. Joshua 14, 15. Goliath and his brothers. A thousand years after the patriarchs lived, the Bible records that giants were still around. Of course, the most famous giant in the Bible was Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Depending on the length of a cubit, 17 and a half to 20 and a half inches, Goliath could have been anywhere from nine and one half to 13 feet tall. Goliath was a descendant of the race of giants that traced back from the Rephaim, a vestige of the Nephilim. Later, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, we read about Goliath and his four brothers. Ishbi Benob was a descendant of the Repha. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. He had cornered David and was about to kill him, but Abishai, son of Zeruiah came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Then David's men declared, You are not going out to battle with us again. Why risk snuffing out the light of Israel? After this there was another battle against the Philistines at Gob. As they fought, Sibachai from Huzba killed Saph, another descendant of the Rapha. During another battle at Gob, Elahan, son of Jair from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all, who also was a descendant of the giants. But when he defied and taunted Israel... He was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shemaiah. These four Philistines were descendants of the Rapha of Gath, but David and his warriors killed them. 2 Samuel 21, 16 through 22. This story is also told in 1 Chronicles 20, 4 through 21, 1. A twelve-fingered giant. In the above passages of Scripture, we read of a giant who had six fingers on each hand. There are many legends among North American Indians of giants, and even giants with six fingers. One legend relates that the Indians, when greeting a stranger, would hold up their hand for the purpose of checking out the number of fingers the stranger had. Those with six fingers were considered to be associated with mythological creatures of the past and were considered dangerous. Samson's Stunning Saga The life of Samson is one of the amazing sagas in the Bible that counters the arguments of those who would discount the Bible accounts of ancient heroes as being nothing more than mythological folklore. Although there is no mention of Samson being a giant, he did in fact have some of the same physical traits as giants when it comes to his strength. The Bible reveals that it was God who gave Samson his strength. In the book of Judges, we read the incredible account of his life. Samson displayed superhuman feats of physical strength unparalleled in the life of any other biblical character. His story began with an amazing introduction 
An angel appeared to his mother and announced Samson's birth and mission. Quote, For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the land of the Philistines. End quote. Judges 13, verse 5. Then the angel ascended up the flames of a sacrifice being offered and disappears. Next, we read about Samson's extraordinary exploits. Quote, but Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. End quote. Judges 16, verse 3. Samson tore out a giant set of city gates and posts that were sunk into the ground, along with the crossbeam that held them together. The two gates would have been enormously heavy since they would have had nail studs and were covered with metal to prevent them from being burned during an attack. Their weight could be compared to the weight of a car. Samson lifted the city gates onto his shoulders and carried them some distance. In another episode, Samson killed a thousand men with a jawbone after he killed a lion. Samson was a remarkable man. But he was a flawed man. His character was weak and deficient. After being captured by his enemies and losing his eyes, he humbled himself and asked God to give him one more opportunity to destroy his enemy with his physical strength. His final exploit was bringing the Philistines' public house down, killing 3,000 people on the roof of the temple not to mention those killed underneath the roof, where Samson's enemies were worshipping their heathen gods while celebrating his capture. Is this story fiction? If so, then where does one start believing in all the supernatural accounts in the Bible? Obviously, the story of Samson parallels many of the legends of ancient mythology, which suggests that such historical records may have a core of truth. This would mean that there is much more to learn about the ancients and their stories of the giants and heroes of antiquity. <laughs>